The problem with a big goal is that it's daunting enough so it might paralyze you and there's a high probability of failure. And so imagine that you're your own child. Okay, now imagine you love this child and you would like him, we'll say him because it's you and I talking, to succeed. Now you have an ideal for this child. You'd like him to grow up to be the best he can be, better than you, the best man he can be. That's what you want for your son. If the good part of you is talking, you definitely want him to be better than you are, but you want him to be the best he could be if your vision is unclouded. Okay, but then you offer him a goal. It's like, well, do this. Well, can he do it? Well, if he can do it without a second's thought, there's no challenge in it. There's no developmental impetus. It's not in the zone of proximal development. You want a goal that you can do, but that requires some improvement on your part. Because you want to attain the goal, that's satisfying, but then you want to make yourself into the thing that can attain goals. There's an ample psychological literature that suggests that that's where maximal motivation is to be found. You're pursuing a goal, but you're also pursuing the goal of transforming yourself at the same time. We generally equate happiness with the activation of the circuitry that's associated with extroversion. And drugs like cocaine and amphetamines activate that circuit. But there's another personality dimension, which is openness. And openness is the creativity dimension. And there's pleasure to be derived from that as well. And that, so that's philosophical exploration and, and literary experience. And I suppose when you go to a movie, you, you experience a blend of those two things, especially if it's a rather complex movie. So there's different forms of engagement or pleasure to be found. And some of them are more akin to happiness and some of them are more akin to, to meaning. And sometimes they come into conflict, but, but I think all things considered, they, they work best when they're working together. And I, I do strive diligently to, re, and I think that this has really been brought home to me. You know, look, I couldn't sit down. I literally couldn't sit down for almost a year. And I, so I lost the ability to sit down. I had fantasies for hours of being able to sit by a fireplace and just not move because I had this condition called akathisia. I learned how, in, how valuable it is to be able to sit down. And now when I sit down and nothing is happening, I, I'm taking stock of that and noticing what an un- unbelievable gift that is. And it is really useful to maintain your ability to see what you have that you've taken for granted because you can lose, you can lose everything. You can lose things you don't even know you have. I had no idea that you could ever lose the ability just to sit down but you can, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. So I'm more appreciative, I would say, of simpler things than I was. I'm more appreciative of other people than I was. I'm probably more grateful, all things considered, than I was. Uh, And hopefully that will continue developing. I I have no contempt for happiness. You know, I, I tell people, don't pursue happiness, pursue meaning. And I think that's true, but if happiness comes along, it should be welcomed. And if you're ever somewhere where that's happening, you should notice it and and be grateful for it and enjoy it. And inadequacy is a pathway that you can travel down, right? A recognized inadequacy is, as soon as it's such a gift in some sense, if if it's accurate. I mean, because you think, well, what should I do? What should I do with my life? That's a real complicated question. Oh, here's an inadequacy. Excellent, you have, a, pl- you have a, a goal now, rectify it. Now, you still have to think strategically and figure out how to rectify it and do it step by step. And Carl Rogers, the psychotherapist, pointed out that the person, for therapy to be successful, the person has to want to change. So they have to have recognized that they have a problem. If, the, if someone is mandated by the court to attend therapy, It's very difficult for the therapist to convince them that they have a problem. Once you're convinced you have a problem, it's like, away you go. You know, I know it's still technically difficult, requires discipline and all of that. There's no magic solution. But if you're plagued by feelings of inferiority, you should rectify the most obvious inferiority. I would say that you have to rectify an inadequacy when it's clearly an impediment to your goal. Or you have to shift goals. But if you're shifting goals because of a inadequacy related impediment then you have to ask yourself are you is your desire to shift the goal reliable 
or are you just taking the easy way out? You can protect yourself by, by picking a different goal that's more difficult. That, that's a good mental hygiene practice because sometimes you should switch goals rather than rectifying inadequacies. But you can fool yourself then and, and that's, a, that's not good. Life will pay any price you ask him. I gave him the quarter. And then something really interesting happened. He took the quarter. He looked at the quarter. He looked at me. He looked at my pocket. He looked back at the quarter, looked at me, looked at my pocket, looked at me again, looked at the quarter, looked at my pocket, looked back at me and said, you're weird. And then he shuffled on off like this. You know? And I thought to myself, wow, what's the difference between him and me? I mean, I was 24, 25 at the time, doing what I love most, have my mission in life. And he's in his early 60s, drunk on the street, begging for quarters. What's the difference? And I thought, well, maybe God's blessed me because I'm such a good person. I thought, oh, it's, he's such a bad person, that's such a bull. And I thought, wow, maybe the answer to that question is what I just told him. Life will pay whatever price you ask of it. But you know what's interesting? You gotta ask intelligently. In the Bible it says, ask and you shall what? Pretty good formula, you ought to look into it. But you know what? It says, ask and you shall receive, but I'm sure it meant ask intelligently. I'm sure that's what God meant. I'm sure he didn't mean bitch and you will receive. Wine and you will receive. I don't think that was the instruction. Now if you were gonna ask intelligently, there might be five elements of that. Number one, you'd have to ask specifically, wouldn't you? You wouldn't ask in a general way. People do all the time, they go, I want more money. Fine, here's a dollar, get out of here. Very often you're getting what you're asking for, you're just not aware of how general you're asking. Clarity is power. The more clear you are about exactly what it is you want, the more your brain knows how to get there. Your brain is a servo mechanism. It's like a bomb. Those bombs, those missiles, they have a servo mechanism. So if the target moves, it knows what the target is, it follows it. Your brain, when you condition it, knows exactly what to go for, and it'll find a way to get there. Do you ever buy a certain outfit or a certain car and suddenly see that car outfit everywhere? How many of you ever had that experience? Say, I. How come that car outfit's everywhere? It always was everywhere, but now you notice it. And the reason is because there's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system, the RAS. That part of your brain determines what you notice and what you don't notice. Your brain spends most of its time trying to make sure you don't notice because you'll go crazy if you notice everything. But when you decide what's most important to you, your brain goes after it. Everyone I know who's successful builds what I call an RPM plan. An RPM is built on the metaphor that the way to get from where you are to where do you want to go to the fastest is you got to build power, like in a car, RPMs. And the R stands for they know the result they're after. They know what they want precisely. If you don't know exactly what you want or you let yourself get beyond that into something general, you're not going to achieve it. Clarity is power. You've got to know the specific result you're after. What do you want? You can't answer that question right now in your personal life in your body, in your relationships, in your finances, in your spirituality, then you're not going to be as fulfilled as you want to be. Today we're going to have the answer to one of those questions at least. The second part of it, you got to know P, why you're doing it. Because you know what, you may get a big goal, so I want to make a billion dollars, I want to bring peace to the earth. Why? As soon as you come up with a goal, all the obstacles show up. Unless you've got enough emotional drive to break through that, you're never going to discover what it really takes. So you got to get yourself past that. The way to get past that is have enough reasons. Reasons come first, answers come second. This man did not know what he wanted, he did not have enough reasons. To ask intelligently, you got to ask specifically. To ask intelligently, you got to know why you want it, have enough drive to make it happen, enough juice to make it happen. If you don't have enough reasons, you will not make it happen. And the M is, what is your massive action plan? What is going to get you to actually fall through? Because the first plan's not going to work and the second plan's going to work, so you better have enough plans that if the first two don't work, you still got something else. Otherwise, you're going to be having excuses why it didn't work. So asking intelligently requires that. So if we're going to be extraordinary in our results, we've got to be in an extraordinary state, we've got to know what we want and we've got to go use it.